Following the 1897 invasion of Benin, the British then proceeded to make the whole of Nigeria a single colony and property of the British Empire, with the revoking of the charter of the Royal Niger Company in 1899 and the amalgamation of the Northern and Southern Protectorates in 1914. The Royal Niger Company was established as a United Africa Company in 1879. The founder, George Goldie Topman, who arrived in the Niger Basin in 1877, had developed a single-minded intention of imperial acquisition of the Niger territories. Different firms had earlier been established by British and other European merchants. Upon Goldie's arrival, he sought to establish a trading monopoly maintained by political control and to have the different British firms under one conglomerate. In 1879, he successfully pulled together the three biggest firms operating on the Niger, Holland Jack and Company, Miller Brothers and James Pinnock to create the United African Company. The amalgamation of these individual firms into one would lead to an expansion of the company and in 1882, the company became known as a National African Company. In 1884, Gordy brought out three French competitors, two small French companies and the all-important Compagnie Française de l'Afrique Équatoriale, making the company by far the largest firm on the Niger. This was no small feat and it was achieved just two weeks before the Berlin Conference. This feat allowed the British the right to claim a protectorate over the Niger districts. However, this protectorate was threatened by French and German expansionist desires for trading outlets in the niger benue area. Hence, the British had to take some action to protect their territory. At the time, Goldie Tubman was pressing for a royal charter, Seeing how the activities of the company were instrumental to its gaining ultimate control of the Niger and Benue, the British, in July 1886, granted a National African Company a royal charter despite reservations expressed by some groups of traders, such as the Liverpool traders. The company would go on to change its name to Royal Niger Company in order to reflect its elevated status. The Royal Charter gave the company the power to control the political administration and trade policies of any local territories which it could gain legal treaties, provided that the company did not interfere in local religions, laws or customs, except if it was necessary to discourage the practice of slavery. Goldie's aim of monopolization led him to put in place some destructive measures. First was the circumvention of the coastal middlemen. This led to the undercutting of the commercial activities of the Liverpool merchants who traded through these middlemen. Also, he went on to replace the monopoly of the coastal middlemen with that of his own company. The company acted as a monopolist in supplying imported goods to African producers. At the same time, it manipulated the prices at which the producers supplied goods, hence forcing them to supply at prices well below that in neighboring territories. Furthermore, there was the establishment of high tariffs on imports and exports. The trading license was set at £150 per annum. This struck out the African middlemen. As for the bigger firms, an additional fee of £100 was to be paid if they intended to trade in alcohol. Import duties were set at a near 100%, thus discouraging these firms from trading. As a result of these policies, the Royal Niger Company would come under a lot of backlash. Several complaints and petitions were written against its conduct. Vice Consul of the Oil River Protectorate, Harry Johnston, wrote a detailed complaint. Bishop Samuel Ajayi Crowther was also critical of the company's conduct. 
The German firm Honigsberg laid out a complaint against the Royal Niger Company for its oppressive trading practices and the obstruction of its vessels despite having paid the requisite license fees. However, with the aid of the Marquis of Salisbury, the Royal Niger Company was able to ride past the waves of criticism. In 1887, the British sought to amalgamate the All River Protectorate and the Royal Niger Company. This would trigger immediate objection and opposition from several quarters. At the same time, the Liverpool traders would go into intense negotiation with the company and the British government to extend the charter to the All River Protectorate. The implementation of this scheme would, however, fail largely due to the strong opposition and powerful lobbying by big shipping companies in Britain. The amalgamation was suspended and the scheme was a total failure. This was the start of the decline of the Royal Niger Company. In 1895, two crucial events occurred and were major factors in the collapse of the Royal Niger Company. First was the appointment of Joseph Chamberlain as colonial secretary. He was an avowed opponent of Salisbury, he opted for the position of colonial secretary so he could influence government policies in the colonies and protectorate as part of his own imperial philosophy. The other event was the attack on the Royal Niger Company's principal port facilities at Akasa by the Nembe of Brass. These middlemen had been severely oppressed by the company's policy. They took temporary control of the station at Akasa. The British led a counter-attack and raised Nembe to the ground. Thereafter, a special commission was set up to investigate the complaints of the brass people. The special commission, led by Sergeant Kirk after a thorough investigation, did not apportion blame to either party. Instead, he devised a plan known as a Kirk plan, that is, the transformation of the Royal Niger Company into a purely administrative body with £400,000 working capital and an annual dividend of 5%. The end of the Royal Niger Company would eventually come when proposals for the revocation of the charter were made by Sir Ralph Moore, the High Commissioner of the Niger Coast Protectorate. However, as a result of the charter's non-provision for legal consequences of revocation and the cost which the company had incurred, the Royal Niger Company was to be paid a compensatory sum of £500,000. This was reviewed and later set at £700,000. Eventually, the total appropriated sum by the British Parliament was £856,895, of which £556,895 was paid directly to the Royal Niger Company. In addition, the government agreed to pay the Royal Niger Company one half of all royalties on minerals produced in much of the former Niger territory for 99 years. The revocation of the charter was first recorded in a letter written in June 1899 from the Foreign Office to the Treasury. It was completed by a warrant signed by Queen Victoria in December 1899 and the handover of assets was finalized on January 1, 1900. The terms of revocation and compensation were reduced into an Act of Parliament, the Royal Niger Company Act of 1899. Afterwards, the company became the Niger Company, it was eventually bought for £8.5 million in 1920 by the Lever Brothers of the Unilever Group. It was traded under its original name, the United African Company, UAC, and it's still a part of the Unilever Group even to this day. By the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, the British had gained absolute and overt control over the territory now known today as Nigeria. There was a complete annexation of Lagos in 1861. Also, by 1885, after the Berlin Conference, the Southern Protectorate was claimed by the British. Following the conquest of the Sokoto Caliphate in 1903, they had the Northern Protectorate under their wings. Hence, there were three separate territories, the colony of Lagos, the southern protectorate, and the northern protectorates. 
In 1906, Sir Walter Egerton fused the colony of Lagos with the Southern Protectorates. This event laid the foundation for the eventual amalgamation of the Southern and Northern Protectorates in 1914. The Southern Protectorate was far more prosperous than the Northern Protectorates. The latter lacked outlets for the exportation of its agricultural produce or imports of essential goods, and it was constantly in need of revenue to develop its railway lines and improve social amenities. As a result, the North ran at a severe deficit and relied heavily on the British Treasury for financial support. At the time, the deficit was met by a subsidy from the Southern Protectorate and the British also gave an imperial grant in aid of about £300,000 a year. As of 1914, the economy of the Northern Protectorate had struggled under the indirect rule and had not become self-financing. The colonial office and Lord Frederick Lugard believed that centralizing the protectorates under a single administration would be economically beneficial. The unification of the protectorate would bring better financial management to the country. Lugard, after the conquest of the Sokoto Caliphate, left northern Nigeria in 1906. He was, however, brought back in 1912 to oversee the amalgamation of the protectorates. The Hausa land in the 18th century had been plagued with excess socio-economic issues, ranging from social degeneration to oppression, corruption, frivolities and the likes. Sheikh Usman Danfodio would lead a jihad or a holy war in 1804 as a reaction to the prevalent hypertensive materialistic individualism in Hausa land. By 1810, Danfodio had gained absolute control over the entire Hausa states. The caliphate would be ruled based solely on Islamic laws and values. The influence of the caliph would now grow rapidly, covering an expanse of land including Bida, Yola and Ilori. The Royal Niger Company at the same period had set up protectorates in different regions such as Benin and Calabar. Ultimately, these regions became known as the Niger Coast Protectorate. The advancement of the French towards the Bainway, despite the presence of the company on the Niger, would lead the company to conquer Nupi and Ilori, both in the north. However, their goal was to capture the entire Sokoto Caliphate. Following the revocation of the Royal Charter in 1900, the company's northern territories became the protectorate of northern Nigeria. Frederick Lugard, a one-time employee of the Royal Niger Company and head of the West African Frontier Force, was appointed High Commissioner by the Colonial Office in London. Earlier on in 1899, the Royal Niger Company had attempted to erect a military post and a British resident in Sokoto. They would, however, be met with severe opposition from the Sultan. Lugard feared the growing influence of the Sultan might lead to an undermining of his authority and, most importantly, internal revolt within the British-controlled territories. This convinced Lugard that the only effective way of securing the protectorate was the military conquest of Sokoto and its assimilation into the protectorate of northern Nigeria. Lugard began his conquest of the Sokoto Caliphate with the conquering of the Emirates of Bida and Kontagora on the Niger and Yola on the Benue. He deposed the emirs of these emirates and installed new emirs whose primary qualification to rule was a willingness to submit to Lugard's authority. Thereafter, Lugard and his forces moved into Bauchi and Gombe, and in 1902, Lugard conquered Zaria. The news of the conquest had spread to Kano and the cities began to prepare for war. The walls were rebuilt and further strengthened. The British forces would be met with heavy resistance in Kano. On February 3, 1903, Lugard invaded the Kano Emirate with 24 officers, 12 non-commissioned officers, 2 medical officers and 722 rank and file made up of 550 foot soldiers, 71 artillery men and 101 mounted infantry with 75mm guns and 4 Maxim guns. The walls of Kano were impregnable. Unfortunately, this would not be for long. The British found their way through the gates in the west and broke into the strong resistance of Kano. The Emir fled and the Kano troops surrendered. 
Up next was Sokoto. As a result of the decentralized nature of the caliphate, Sokoto had no standing army that could be dispatched almost immediately. Hence, the sultan at the time, Atahiru, met with his men and began preparations for the impending war. On February 27, 1903, Lugard and his forces converged in Kwara Namuda. No sooner had the sultan and his men begun preparations than the British struck. The British army had an arsenal of 25 officers, five non-commissioned officers, two medical officers and one medical non-commissioned officer, 68 gunners, 656 rank and file, 400 carriers, four Maxims and four 75mm guns. On the contrary, the Sokoto warriors were armed with spears, arrows and Dane guns. Just as it was in Kano, the British would be met with stiff resistance. As the war progressed, the superior weapons of the British forces outweighed those of the Sokoto forces. On March 15, a few days after the start of the war, the Sultan was impelled to flee and Sokoto surrendered to the British. Lugard would, however, pursue Sultan Atahiru and on July 27, 1903, his soldiers killed him at the Second Battle of Brumi, about 200 miles southeast of Kano, present-day Gombe State. Once Sultan Atahiru's corpse was identified, his head was cut off and the photos were circulated to stem further opposition and to prove to his surviving supporters that their revered Sultan was dead. Lugard would then incorporate all these emirates into the northern protectorate, signaling the end of the Sokoto Caliphate, with the emirs willing to rule under British authority to keep their positions. On January 1, 1914, Lord Frederick Lugard amalgamated the southern and northern protectorate into one geographical entity called Nigeria. Following the amalgamation in 1914, the protectorate was divided into two spheres, the southern and northern provinces, each under a lieutenant governor responsible to and on behalf of the governor general. Lord Lugard would go on to become the first Governor-General of the newly unified Nigeria and would remain in power until 1919. He set up a system of administration, the indirect rule system that allowed traditional chiefs to continue ruling their communities, albeit as subordinates to British colonial officers. With the complete domination of northern Nigeria, the British would continue their invasion into the Igbo heartland with the destruction of Arochuku. You can check out the full story in our next episode.